This is 16 to 1, a podcast about education, teaching, and learning. She's literally standing there and she's like sad and all of this stuff. She waves a hand and like becomes Katy Perry. So she like stands up straight and her like arms go out and she smiles. It's very like eerie because it's like this is what fame requires. You hand wave and you become your alter ego. Like it's just like, I mean, it's not just Katy Perry. It's, I mean, I have to do the same thing when I go teach, I Uh suppose. But it was just so interesting to see someone have that moment. Yeah. We all have those moments. It's like before you walk in a room, before you pick up a phone, before you, you know, hers was literally like as she was standing on the platform to go up to the stage and she was standing there. She had poor posture. She was like slumped. She kept stopping and like hem hauling. And then all of a sudden she just like stood up straight, put her hand on her hip and just smiled. And that was the cue. Isn't that weird? I'll show it to you. It's kind of an interesting scene. Is that a story of how we're starting tonight's podcast episode? I feel like I have to. Turn on my podcast voice. Turn on your podcast. I also just slept for persona. like two hours. Yeah. So my eyes aren't quite adjusted. <laughs> and my voice sounds like this. Yeah. So we're both a couple of days post booster. And also you got a flu shot. And mm-hmm. we're both kind of feeling and gross. Ohio had its first freeze. Like yes. real freeze. Weather, the weather has turned on us. We and went so straight like, from summer to winter, I think. I mean, like a week ago, it was like 70 degrees, 72 yeah, it was degrees. Yeah, low of 28 today. And then this morning, I had to defrost my yep. car. Yep. yep and yep, yep. the geese are flying away home. <laughs> They're going down south. I'm going with them. I hope the mics pick that up. <laughs> they might have. They're kind of loud. Honk, honk. <laughs> but yeah i just it's a bad combo yeah like i was okay from the booster i was just kind of achy uh-huh. like it wasn't i mean i would have gone to work if i had to flu shot will knock you out though i think it's just the combo i really think it's mostly the weather that's yeah. hitting me right now because yeah. that's a big dip right now yep. we're in like the 20s and yep. the 30s yep <laughs> so just you know going through it our bodies are like no yeah no yeah Okay, so quick reminder, top of the episode, we're not going to be here next episode. That's going to be Thanksgiving break. We're also not going to be here the week of Christmas, whatever that week is. We give ourselves off two episodes a year, and those two are coming up. Should have made it three. Oh, man. I could have used it tonight. You might be finding out later. This is not an episode. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Anyway, let's power through it. Yada, yada, yada. Yada, yada, yada. What's up? what's up what are you doing are you good are you good what are we talking about today uh we are talking about the psychology of learning yes a very light psychology november subject a light november subject we love when it's bright and airy in the dead of november yep just pull out there aren't a lot of big words pull out the old psychology textbook there aren't a lot of names that i might not be able to say uh, I think I mentioned John Dewey in here at some point. Yeah, so. that's mine. Dibs. Okay. Anything shorter than how many letters is Dewey? Five. I'll take five. Okay. okay. There aren't very many of them, but he's we'll, mine. We'll let you have him. Uh, so what is it? Yeah. So it's this. It's the theoretical science that maybe uses a behaviorist approach or neuroscience or social cognition or, and we'll talk about what all of those buzzwords are. But psychology basically to teachers about how we, I'm going to use words that are philosophically difficult, but how mm. we get learning in our brains, minds. Wow. Um, it's hard because get that scientists. learning in there. How we get learning in us. That's there what we should have said today. Can you get the learning in there, Can please? Can you get learning in me? <laughs> so, I mean, it's, it's weird because, you know, neuroscience would be like, oh, this is about how the brain functions. But behaviorists might be more like this is how the mind interacts with its environment or something like that. So everybody who has a take on this and these kinds of problems go back to, you know, there's philosophy having to do with this stuff all the way, all the way back to the ancients so way way back way way back (laughs) but we're kind of just gonna take an approach uh, take a stab at modern the sort of history of modern educational psychology uh so we're not going into an entire history of all the thinking that got us where we are now but we're sort of starting in like before the 1950s so like 
pre-war or some stuff pre-war, but mostly from the 1950s on when this stuff has started developing more as a field of its own. Hmm. Yeah. I would have expected this to happen a lot sooner as a field. Well, I think that psychology I mean, is like such... like parts of it that... Yeah. Psychology is such as like a modern science is in the grand scheme of human history a relatively recent invention. Oh. There's plenty of like philosophy and epistemology that happens, which is like theories of knowledge and how we acquire knowledge and where it comes from and stuff like that. There's plenty of that stuff out there prior to this time, but we yeah, are not that podcast. Well, yeah, I mean, we probably will be at some point, but not right now. We're not. Let's take a little break on uh, psychology in the dead of winter, just to like, yeah, when there's more daylight than not, that's when we'll bring it back. Okay, around. sounds good. Deal? Sounds good. This will be the last show about psychology. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm really until just... the sun shines. I do think this upon stuff us. is interesting. I took at least one of my education classes was pretty deeply rooted in this kind of stuff. Yes, so um, mine too. I think as I I'm one. reading it, it's slowly coming back. Yes. But um, could I have taken better notes? Probably. Yeah, I think I. I think I also only ever had one class that primarily concerned itself with this stuff. I know that I <laughs> had. I was signed up for another. Wait. What was your master's in? <laughs> well, philosophy and education. <laughs> philosophy and education, though, not psychology. So I did... I know, I just say, like, you're right. It was not literally psychology, well, but it feels a lot like that. The borders can get blurred, for sure, um, <laughs> when it comes to thinkers working in this field. And I was signed up to take another psych class at Teachers College, but I thought the instructor was Looney Tunes, so I dropped it the very first day. Are they like, like really well published and like she? Yes, nutty? she was like a she's like a social media person. She was very very really? obsessed with like her online presence and Ooh. her image. And Do you she remember her name? Like, she was like, you can't take detailed notes. You can't have recorders in my class because she didn't want to be caught on record saying something dumb. And I was like, I don't even care to record you, but this is a red flag. I'm I'm leaving. Do you remember her name? No. Oh, I wanted to go look at her Twitter. Yeah. She's probably gotten fired since then. Well, she was like, <laughs> I think, I think one of her focus areas might have been sex education, which made her louder about things. Than most. Even. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know what her deal was, but wow. I got real bad vibes what from a it. Brand. And then I was like, you know what? I would have liked to have learned about this subject more, but I'm going to have to back on out of this class because I you will lose my mind. You should have. Nope. Nope. You probably would have dropped out. Like, she also was like, there are mandatory tests on this day only. You have to come even if you are on your deathbed ill because I will not re let you retake this test ever because blah, blah, blah. And I was like, you're, an, you, you, you have problems. Psychological problems. I'm like, also, you're teaching at Teachers College. You should know that this is not a healthy approach to learning. Mm -hmm. But anyway. Isn't that the greatest irony? Oh, some, when of, the, the, people some teaching... of the worst teaching I had was at Teachers College. Not going to lie. Well, I just mean when, yeah. Yeah, when people teaching you about teaching, I'm like, oh. <laughs> well, my favorite thing that happened there was that everybody would stand up there and tell you that, how, like, st sage on the stage lecturing approaches, like, where, you know, there's a it's person bad. just standing in the front of the room. Yeah, is bad because that's not really how people best retain knowledge. But they would tell you that via a lecture standing in front of the room. Oh. Yeah. Do as I say, not as I do. Yeah. It was it. great. Anyway, Sorry that's that. enough of that rant. But just fascinating. But basically, no. I think I only ever had one class, maybe that touched on some of these models of learning and uh, psychology. And I think it actually might have had to do with the like gifted education stuff. That class that I took. It was gifted because it, man. it was like trying to show from informed points of mm. you know educational psychology different approaches to sure that. So. Can I mention one last thing before we sure. jump into the meat and potatoes of this? I need everyone who's listening to know that right now, Chelsea is sitting in our office in a Fox onesie. And I'm not it has. This in the podcast. Yes, you are. No. Why? This is what's adding to the humor of how serious this conversation is. Is that the. It's keeping me warm. The fact that on top of your head is another head with floppy ears. It's like salmon colored fox. <laughs> So, as she's telling Grimes, me, you got this for me. Our biggest podcast fan. That's true. For my but, birthday. Couple but as ago. she's talking, it's just like her and then also a fox. <laughs> There's a fox on my head. <laughs> okay. Prior to the 1950s, much of the psychological learning theories had coalesced around geography more than anything. So, in Germany, there was a strong focus on the Gestalt psychology. Gestalt. Gestalt. <laughs> Gestalt. <laughs> Gestalt. Okay. Well, that's how I've heard it said it's, by philosophy people. So Okay, well. 
Okay, so in Germany, there is a strong focus on Gestalt psychology, which was a school of psychology that provided the foundation for the modern study of perception. Yeah, this is kind of a... You, this is like a granddaddy This, this is a whole big... Yeah, yeah, this is like a whole big theory, and it doesn't just belong to educational psychology. It approaches a lot of different things, but we're talking about it from this one angle. So go ahead, So please. this theory basically states that the whole of anything is greater than its parts. That's a lot to think about, actually. You good? I feel like I've heard that so many times, but I never really thought about where it came from. So that's kind of interesting. I mean, it's kind of like a quick. Yeah. So know, basically, distillation. that is the attributes of the whole are not deducible from analysis of the parts in isolation. So, according to the view applied to educational psychology, learning is the organization and reorganization of behavior, which arises from the interaction of a maturing organism and its environment. Yeah. That, yeah, that's the crux of it right there is that it's this approach to living things in this case you know people who are learning mm -hmm. interacting with the environment and that's kind of like where learning comes from huh. okay so in america then a strong focus was on behaviorism which focused yes. on exploring observable psychological concepts mm -hmm. so this explored like learning mechanisms that could be tested on animals yeah like b big experimental psychology push here does like rat stuff yeah it also comes about sort of as a refutation maybe a little bit of psychology that looks more into interiority and like the inner mind mm. um and using you know first person accounts to talk about psychology this is sort of a little Rather bit than okay this is sort of a little bit opposed to that approach because it's like well no if we're going to be a hard science we have to have you know these things. observable repeatable sure. phenomena we gotta so anyway that's, oh, what, okay. that's what that's about okay so then in russia which was at the time the soviet union yeah. they provided the cultural history approach towards psychology which described learning in the context of one's environment so this perspective viewed learning as a concept that can be directed and supported in institutions like schools. Yeah, so not happening. This seems, yeah, not happening in isolation from. It, it's basically like, well, maybe we shouldn't stick children in labs to observe how they. I I'm on their side. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> turns yeah. out it's it's that the, seems, the social that seems good. Social approach is, is significant. Okay, so then. Outside of those, we have Piaget's constructivism, which described learning as a way learners can construct their knowledge by expanding and changing their ideas based on the information that they received, which I wish my students did today. Piaget is a really interesting, it's like a whole, he's a whole big thing. He has a background in philosophy and he's got, he's got really interesting, mm -hmm. uh, he's a big one, I think, and definitely one that we talked about in grad school. To some extent. Yeah, there was definitely some of that. Actually, PSA could probably be a whole podcast episode. Yeah, honestly. I think maybe we should consider That's it. Probably not a bad idea. Out, we can figure out how not to make it absolutely boring to yeah. everyone. And then we should do that yeah, because it is very much. It is in, good stuff. It's good stuff. It's like, very much in the weeds of yeah, you know, psychology, education, all these kinds of stuff. Philosophy. Um, sorry, and then the last couple Freud's work on psychoanalysis and then dewey's theories on schooling and learning were also major um contributors during this time yeah so we have it by like general location like germany america or the soviet union and then also just on top those three big ones yeah yep. so after world war ii two major schools of psych theory became very prominent one was the rise of radical behaviorism and that all came from the work of bf skinner definitely read this guy in grad school yeah i did See, or at least talked about is, him this is coming to me uh, very very slowly like mm -hmm. i said so skinner was a professor of psychology at harvard and so his thought basically was that he believed that free will was an illusion nice that's kind of okay so he saw human action <laughs> are you mad about it <laughs> yeah, i'm kind of going through it now again uh, so uh, we're just casually dropping i know into the pod like, that free will doesn't exist right so skinner saw human action as dependent on consequences of previous actions a theory he would call the principle of reinforcement yeah it's like a causal chain one so, thing causes another causes another yeah so basically if the consequence and consequences to an action are bad there's a high chance the action will not be repeated if the consequences are good the probability of the action being repeated becomes stronger yep that seems right in practice <laughs> i can't think of too many examples where that has been proven true <laughs> with mm -hmm. my students but um skinner viewed human behavior is determined by the individual's interactions with one's environment he argued that humans are controlled by external factors such that l human learning is predicated on the environmental information one receives from one's surroundings so these humanistic qualities like identity hope love all of those things 
were neglected in his work yeah he's like who and cares I, about all that yeah and i think those are exactly the things that i'm seeing missing from students who aren't know. making those decisions you've talked exactly about yep. that kind of thing but this this radical behaviorism approach is like nope it's just like input in output out and it's all deterministic yeah. and you can't escape it no matter what you do i think generally speaking what he's saying does make sense but it has to have those factors also that we don't have free will makes sense <laughs> makes a lot of sense to you no but i think that there's something to be said that there there definitely are students who learn from the consequences right to oh, not sure. repeat something but that doesn't come without also the knowledge that there is an identity involved whatever happens at home happens at home well, the, the, like yeah this is like taking like the pavlovian experiment yeah. to an extreme and yeah. applying it to educational psychology sure. i mean i'm not exactly sure pavlov is i mentioned him in here somewhere but it's around the same time you know time general time frame that pavlov is doing experimentation well what i was just about to say we're going to talk about him mm -hmm. and he's one of my favorites is that this completely misses all of what maslow did right this is a theory completely absent of maslow's idea yeah, which is so fascinating because I, I guess what I'm trying to say is, is that um, students won't learn until they're loved and cared for. And so they mm -hmm. will not learn from things until you know what I mean. Yeah, I mean, it's the next bullet point if you yeah, want to sorry. take it. We're talking okay. about Carl Rogers and Mas Abraham Maslow. Yeah. So these are the humanistic views of psychology. Haven't we done At least a, whole a bit episode? more humanistic? What was that? We've done a whole episode on Maslow. Yes, right? we did a, the episode on the hierarchy. Okay. So we have Carl Rogers and Abraham Maslow. So in 1951, Rogers introduced the concepts of client-based therapy and introduced related terms such as student-centered teacher and significant learning. Okay, student-centered teacher was a big thing. Yeah, that I'm thinking. Yep. Again. <laughs> I like picked up as I read that. I, I was like, Ugh. I was just going through like so, so a lot of this is from the Wikipedia article yeah. on educational psychology. But I was trying to kind of like distill things down. But I was trying to definitely hit on all the ones that I know for sure are very popular in. Yeah higher education circles when it yes. comes to training te teacher training yeah student center like teacher is who i'm sure i could find an old essay about that yep um and then as previously mentioned maslow's hierarchy of needs is um, a model that influenced the psychology of learning as well and what it basically suggests is that people have to meet their their basic physical social mental needs before they can do any sort of higher level learning thinking cognitive like all of that mm -hmm. so you have to meet the baseline of what you need as a human in order to achieve mm -hmm. further learning. So this is a reaction against radical behaviorism. Yes. It's putting interiority back into the picture and saying, hey, if your mental state is such that you can't get out of bed in the morning because you're hungry, if you're hungry, then you're not you're gonna sleepy, learn. You're cold, you have no clean water, like nobody loves you. Right. Like you don't, you have no one who serves as your alarm clock. You know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. those types of things. I have to say right now I'm seeing that that's like the number one indicator for most of our students. Mm -hmm. when it comes to like who we've got our eyes on as far as concerns for dropping out and stuff like that that at just how they act at school the decisions they make stability is what they need you know mm -hmm. so maslow's is just kicking butt forever and ever i guess mm -hmm. so anyways so evolving from that during the 1970s learning began to be viewed as an integral part of life in the world which is a broad statement but it mm -hmm. it's like a little bit of the hippification of educational psychology that's probably a rude way to say it, but that's just what I'm saying. Yep. I'm going with it. We're getting hip with started, it. <laughs> started to be seen as part of personal and social enrichment. So we get concepts like lifelong learning and adult education, classes for retirees at your community college, that kind of stuff, mm -hmm. um, focusing on on learning as a system of osmosis between society and learners and schools and stuff like that. We also see learning start to be connected with liberation and emancipation. And again, this is a lot to do with the politics of the time. Scholars such as Charles Wright Mills and Paolo Freire, they applied learning as a way to understand and eventually reform the systemic power conditions that exist in society. So this is some, yeah, there's there's a lot of crossover between political movements at the time and hmm. this stuff. So learning theory was broadened to include social context surrounding the learning process, which I think makes sense. Yeah. So other theories developed during the 1980s and beyond. Uh, these might include experiential learning, modeled by David Kolb. Definitely read mm -hmm. all kinds of stuff about experiential learning in mm. grad school. That's um, one of those phrases that just makes me hate it. 
Like, I understand it. it you know what I mean? Well, this stuff Sometimes just gets buzz, these, buzzworded that's into what I mean. oblivion. These buzzwords make me crazy, but I'm like, okay, this checks out. It's an iterative process of experience, reflection, conceptualization, yeah, exactly. and experimentation. Most it's like a words. chart with arrows on it that go in a circle. I, I can just like picture that the page in the textbook from grad school. There's like a Venn diagram. The problem like is a, that yeah. I think this stuff is actually pretty interesting, but the way that we learn about it makes it absolutely ludicrously boring. Absolutely. <sighs> Sad to know. Anyway, <laughs> okay. Next, we have Robert Keegan created a constructive developmental approach that ex- expands upon Piaget's stages of child development to a lifelong process, which includes adulthood. So, we were just talking about Piaget, but Piaget's work basically held that intelligence develops in stages that are related to age hmm. and they're progressive because one stage has to be accomplished before the next can occur. Oh. So, it's like, I don't know. Interesting. It's like you have to. Uh, get to the end of the level before you can unlock the next one basically approach Ooh. to <laughs> educational that psychology feels... okay if you get the easter egg you can skip all the way to level 10 right no that's not really how that works but that's okay, okay. all right I'm not sure about that one mm-hmm. so you got to keep up with your earlier levels of mental abilities to reconstruct concepts it's oh. a pretty weird yeah i mean I, I mean i think i think we have to like take all of this as somebody trying to find the language to describe very very complex processes that happen in human minds and social contexts. As you, yes and, as you develop right and doing that probably is going to involve some level of imprecision in your yeah, language about I think, it i think that's a good point i also think that i think this is just what theoretical science and psychology and like being theoretical at, in any capacity i think just involves that by default but sure yeah i mean I, i'm not saying that i don't believe that there are a series of stages that you have to learn right because it's like things like object permanence like eventually yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know but also like if you pull out this lincoln log everything will fall so i understand generally yeah what this i can't is, remember but it what feels... piaget says happens if you basically like forget one of your stages or something i really can't remember but we should look that up and yeah see what he said about that like but it's you just evolve into like a slobbering toddler again if yeah. you forget your alphabet for a well, day as someone who's recently been talking about retention issues mm-hmm. i'm like well maybe they're not so wrong yeah yeah <laughs> All right. So in 1991, the American psychologist Howard Gardner wrote The Unschooled Mind, which focused on three different types of learning, intuitive, school learning, and expert learning. So intuitive is the most natural, and then occurs in your, uh, mostly in your preschool years. Oh, this is the object permanent Yeah, this is talking about. about. It's almost like, <laughs> had I read the notes more closely, I would know what's coming next. No, okay. it's fine, it's fine. A school learning, obviously, is what's forced upon children during school years, and then the intuitive expert learning is a type of learning that Gardner argues everyone should strive towards. Interesting. Which... Yes, I'm probably <laughs> still checking off some of yeah, those boxes. I mean, so you can tell that a lot of these approaches to ed psych are in conversation with one another and share common yeah. histories, either in, you know, cognitive science, philosophy, whatever it may be. Mm-hmm. So let's just talk about very broadly outside of the sort of history and how things evolve. Let's talk about just a couple of different approaches, because even within the psychology of learning, there are... I don't know if you want to call them schools of thought or just, yeah. I guess I would say like disciplines that people are Discipl- more interested in. I think discipline's in. probably a good word for it. Yeah, they are sometimes in opposition to one another. Sometimes you do something because you don't agree with a particular approach or theory to education or uh, experimental design or whatever it is. But let's just run through some okay. of these. Would you like to take the first yeah, one? Yeah, so the first one is neuroscience. And it is a discipline that combines neuroscience, pedagogy, and psychology, bringing the current research from how the brain learns, behaves, and relates to instructional practices in the classroom. So every class assignment and experience shapes the human brain, Mm -hmm. right? So understanding how the brain processes this information into learning and knowing more is kind of the focus here. And so this helps us understand better what students' brains, like what a student's brain needs to be engaged, responsive, alert. And then it helps teachers reevaluate the learning process to say, okay, how does this you know what I mean? Like, what is this information doing in their brain? Mm-hmm. How do they retain it? Do they retain it? Is right. this the best approach? Right. So, yes, this is a bit of a new field. I mean, and by new, I mean like 1980s kind of. Is when Are you the... saying we're old? <sighs> I mean. <laughs> you sat a little too long on that. <sighs> that was a pretty pregnant pause. It's a new field relative to some of these other yep. uh, approaches and philosophies and whatnot. Because... In the scope of humans. Right. We just didn't have the science... <laughs> Yeah. I mean, and again, I think it gets a little difficult to sort out some of these concepts. And I think sometimes that neuroscience probably gets a little bit 
ahead of itself it puts the cart in front of the horse a little bit in terms of talking about i don't know like even the question is it really brains that learn do brains like the organs the physical organs learn or is it like a mind that learns these are the questions <laughs> that philosophers and psychologists argue about all day long mm. anyway um it's a bit of a new field but there's this increasing need for and presence of school psychologists and that shows us a bit about how neuroscientific approaches to educational psychology make their way into schools school psychologists end up being the bridge to you know between this science and classroom learning more than anything right now i think but yeah still budding science kind of finding its footing yeah we could definitely use more school psychologists yeah for sure I'd say maybe one to one with students would be ideal. Mm -hmm. Just like everybody gets their own. <laughs> just take your own psychologist. Let's you just, just get assigned a psychologist on day one. Let's just unpack it. Yep. You know. Yep. I'm not against it. You know, if we stop defunding education. Whoa, maybe we should do that. So next one. Another discipline. Yeah. Behaviorism. Yes, we talked about this. Yes. This is Skinner and Pavlov. Behaviorism focuses on externally observable behaviors and the constituent parts of knowledge as opposed to like an inward looking approach or a thought. So behaviorists believe that human beings are shaped entirely by their external environment. And so if you alter that person's environment, then you alter their thoughts, feelings and behaviors. Yeah, this is more the, the radical behaviorism mm -hmm. approach. It says like, who cares about what's going on in your your little brain pan? I don't care about your mind or your thoughts. The only thing that determines educational outcomes is input output from the environment brain stuff brain so stuff. in the classroom though these are approaches that reward students for good behavior and punish them for bad ones i don't know it's kind of archaic in some ways i think in the classroom yeah i mean this is just one kind i mean of don't get me example wrong. like do you, you do we have to do these things yes sure. but it's a lot more complex it's a just... kind of it's a kind of crude example of behaviorism yeah. to just say like oh you did a good job here's your star whatever yep. it is but um, there is sometimes something to be said for that approach. No, there it is. It works in some contexts. It maybe doesn't work as well in other contexts. I mean, I think age is a factor. Personality is a factor. Yeah, there's a lot of moving parts yep. there. Yep. Okay, so next. Uh, social cognitive theory. So it's SET. Um, it describes the influence of individual experiences, the actions of others, and environmental factors on individual health behaviors. So SET provides opportunities for social support. Through instilling expectations, self-efficacy, and using observational learning and other reinforcements to achieve better uh, behavior change. This honestly just feels like mm -hmm. being a teacher. I don't know. It gets to be called it a special really thing, is. but it's like social cognitive theory. Okay, so social meaning with other people, that has something to do with it. And mm -hmm. cognitive theory means, okay, how your brain is processing it's everything. processing stuff. It's, it's just... I don't know, you know. It's like they gave a definition to teaching. Yeah. That yeah, and called it a, a school of learning. Yeah. <laughs> but SCT is interested in social cognitive theory, is interested in self-efficacy, behavioral capacity. So it's like understanding and having the skill to perform certain behaviors. So mm -hmm. maybe just asking for a certain kind of behavior isn't enough. Maybe mm -hmm. you have to build up skills so that students can actually engage in those behaviors. Right. Expectations, expectancies, and that's assigning value to outcomes of behavior change. So if someone is misbehaving... You say, okay, hey, if we change your behavior, this is what you can expect. Mm -hmm. uh, Self-control, observational learning, and reinforcements. Cool. It's pretty straightforward. It's just like a lot of, yeah. I mean, I, I feel like a lot of classroom management takes into account these different approaches and things like that. Okay. The next one, possibly my biggest beef with educational psychology, it's called information processing theory or theories. The information processing model places emphasis on how information Entering through the senses is now, again, this is a quote, so I didn't come up with this way of describing, but how information entering through the senses is encoded, so like in a computer, nope. stored, nope. retrieved, and utilized it's by the stored, brain. So don't worry. It doesn't stay there long. Thus, learning becomes the process of committing our symbolic representations to memory, where they may be processed in the study of learning is primarily approached through, through okay. the study of memory. I think we can move on. This feels... <laughs> <laughs> well, an information processing memory is viewed from a computer model perspective by which the mind takes in information, performs operations on it to change its form and content, stores the information, retrieves it when needed, and generates responses to it. Brains are not computers. I'm just going to say this to everyone working in this field. Mm. I appreciate the fact that you have a useful analogy, but I think 
or doing damage to the conversation around humanity when we treat brains like computers and vice versa. Yep. <sighs> like, I wish. Love has no place in an input output machine like this. Like this Mm-mm. this is this this is reads like a technical manual that I would yeah. have to read like, oh my hard drive broke. How do I fix it? I'd open up the page and be my- like well, how is the information encoded? And then it goes through like a, you know, a USB three cable and then it gets stored in the hard drive like that. That this is a bad driver. I don't stuff. know why I don't. I mean, again, maybe the language is this useful. doesn't simplify it in any way that makes it more clear. Well, so day to day instructional design that you, you might take into account some of these approaches because you're interested in how people best process what you're teaching in your mm-hmm. classroom. Let's just say that. But it is a very Fair. weirdly mechanical approach i'm not exactly sure it just seems to be like why would you want to turn humans in, into well, that's what i mean it's like almost not even human it's almost like it gets in the way of itself and gets in the way of understanding humans better to pretend that first that they're computers and then jump off from that point instead of just acknowledging that they're not computers and coming up with our theories based on that but that's just me that's my beef i'm gonna get off my soapbox now what's okay. the next one so the next one i feel like i am not worked up enough for this is co- cognitive and social constructivism. So it's a theory that says that learners construct knowledge rather than just passively take in information. And so as people experience the world and reflect on those experiences, they build their own representations and corporate new information into the, what already exists of mm-hmm. their knowledge, right? To what they already have. Mm-hmm. I think some of my learners probably do this. I don't know that many of my learners are on this level of you know what I mean? This feels like very, very high level sort of thinking. I don't think it's meant to be. I, I think it's just... No, I don't... Uh, okay. What? I understand what this is trying to say. But what I have seen a lot of this year is even when students are presented with valid information, right? Factual things. They still are inclined to change that in their head. Does that make sense? Ah. It's almost like even being presented with something that's true and factual isn't enough for them to then say, okay, I need to update this in my brain, right? This has been proven it's incorrect. A little, it's becoming a little too passive or something. I mean, this is just saying that, like, any information they take in whatsoever, yeah. they do it through That's fair. making something. I guess something. I'm thinking of, like, specific events where I have given factual proof to something and the student's like, well, that's not right. Well, I mean, okay, but I don't think it's about the truth or falsity of the thing being discussed. I think that your kids are probably still doing, according to this theory, the work of constructing new schemas or whatever, or knowledge. Even by not changing. They're constructing new knowledge in their heads by some sort of process, but something is going wonky in the process in that case. It's getting spit back up. But I think the constructivist would probably say that, no, that's still constructivism at work. It's just that the process is a little mangled. That's fair, I suppose. Maybe. I don't know. No, I I think there's something to be said for that. Um, So part of this are the processes of assimilation and accommodation. Mm -hmm. So assimilation is the process of taking new information and fitting it into what already exists in their brain. And then accommodation refers to using newly acquired information to revise and redevelop. The accommodation is what I was thinking of. I Do I think that they're assimilating it? Sure. But in some of the specific things that I'm thinking of, the accommodation doesn't occur uh-huh so like okay i had a student I get tell new me information how do okay, i so f- an example sure. i had a student tell me that it was not one of hitler's explicit goals to kill jews and i said the final solution is proof that that you know what i mean that he did set out to intentionally murder mm-hmm. jews presented the final solution from relevant sources and still that student was like well that's not true yeah, I mean, again, I think that in that case, probably what's going on there is that mm-hmm. they are redeveloping their existing schema, but that just means that they're redeveloping it in a way that is like, well, now I've got to find something to refute that new claim. Sure. So it's like, yeah, the it, processes happen, but they don't necessarily have broken. anticipated outcomes for for teachers, okay. for sure. And that, yeah. Okay. But yeah, I see what you mean there yeah. about how, how there's like an accommodation, something about a breakdown and yeah like it's still not cycle. connecting mm-hmm. some places okay then the last one mm-hmm. is motivation mm-hmm. the thing we all need more of <laughs> the thing i need more of we were just talking about this the other day 
I was listening to that master class. The guy who designed The Sims. Mm -hmm. I can't even remember his name right now. I'm an idiot, but I'll look it up and report back. But the guy who designed The Sims has a master class. He's talking about game design. And they were talking about, he was talking about the role that motivation plays in making gaming experiences fun for players. And motivation is one of those things, because if somebody's not motivated to play your game, they're just going to get bored and walk away. And he was saying something he, he had heard somebody say a lot of problems of education and learning we think are problems of well, how do we teach? How do we get this learning across? But really, like, how do we do education? But they're really problems of how do we motivate? Mm -hmm. How do we motivate kids to want to learn? How do we motivate kids to mm -hmm. be social in constructive ways? That kind of stuff. Yeah. They're really problems of motivation rather than problems of instructional design or something. Sure. Like, your problem is not that your classroom teaching practices are bad. Your problem is that your students aren't motivated mm -hmm. to do whatever it is you're having them do mm -hmm. it feels to me a little bit inspired by maslow like we got to meet some basic needs here first we got to like that that has something to do with motivation mm -hmm. to add a little more of that um ed psych research on motivations concerned with the will that students bring to a task like we were just talking about their level of interest intrinsic motivation yeah. um any goals that they might have that guide their behavior so maybe hey i want to get at least a b on this test something like that and their belief about causes and successes, sorry, causes of their successes or failure. Mm -hmm. There's this form of attribution theory that describes how students' beliefs about the causes of academic success or failure affect their emotions and motivations. You've probably seen a lot of this in your mm -hmm. classroom. Um, there's an example when students attribute failure to lack of ability, and ability is perceived as uncontrollable. Like, well... Hmm. I don't have the ability to do it, therefore it's out of my control. They then experience emotions of shame and embarrassment. Yeah. Those consequently decrease effort and show poorer performance over time. Yeah. So in contrast, and this is where you know a good teacher can step in and kind of subtly redirect a student's thinking about this sort of thing. When students attribute failure to a lack of effort, so like, oh, I see I got a D because I waited till the last minute and mm -hmm. didn't spend enough time mm -hmm. doing it when they attribute it to a lack of effort and effort is perceived as controllable. They're like, oh yeah, I actually, I, I didn't give it my best effort. I, I could have done this and this to, yeah. to have a better outcome. Then they experience emotions of guilt and they consequently increase effort and show improved performance. Kind of interesting. Yeah. It's sort of interesting to be doing this topic right now because... These past few weeks of school have been really hard. Like, we have had some very difficult stuff coming up for our students, and so... Yeah. I don't feel like this is limited to just school either. I, I've been feeling in it. I, I think are just... There's a mm. malaise affecting I everyone and everything. Been, like, I mean, I, some of the things that we've... Like, an event that we had happen is something that I can't remember in nine years happening, happening before... And just like some of the stuff that I've been trying to unpack and work through with some of my students is some of like, it's been really heavy. Yeah. So it's really, I'm pretty run down about it, I guess, is what I'm coming to realize very quickly. And as I'm like thinking about, you know, these, these tools or these psychological approaches to, to look at my, my kids, my guys, especially, it, it gives me a lot to think about, but it's mm -hmm. also like, I, I keep falling back into like Maslow's, like that's the first place I go, obviously. But I think that this idea of, Attributing failure to lack of effort is interesting. But I also see students use that as like, well, I could have done better, but I just didn't try. So it's also like... Oh, uh, they like write it off? Yeah. Interesting. They and skip the guilt phase. Yeah, exactly. I see. Um, and I don't know if that's just them saying it because they're embarrassed that they didn't do it. It's probably some degree that. It yeah. also could be that they're... But I think that some of them, that's absolutely true. Oh, I well, could have done better, but I just didn't try. Yeah, I think also maybe like a home environment that doesn't necessarily mm. value yeah. whatever might contribute to some of that, yeah. too. You never know mm. what's going on. And yeah, as there I'm are a like, lot of factors. Well, and I have parent-teacher conferences coming up, and those are always really telling for me, mm -hmm. too. Mm -hmm. And so it's it's uh, it's kind of fun, actually, to be refreshing on all of this before I meet a bunch of parents, because I'm going to be going through this like, okay, mm -hmm. this is what we have. Mm -hmm. <laughs> to work yep. with or not um, yep this is where i've got to fill in the gaps you know yep all right mm -hmm. any final thoughts before we move on to no, fill in the blank I just you know maybe like send that teacher in your life like a case of wine <laughs> you know <laughs> an entire case just of wine. like check in um, send them some hard liquor yeah just <laughs> chocolate a lot of chocolate. us like that we like snacks we like nice pins don't buy us cheap pens. We need nice pens. Um, teachers are opinionated on pens. This is true. You know, we're we're pretty pe like easy to please as people. We just like want a nice pen. We're also just having a lot of demands being made of you. Yeah, I think I'm 
I'm feeling worn down in a way that I don't ever get to this early in the year. Yeah. And it is scary. Yeah. And I'm not alone. So it's it's very telling of the system. Yep. Well, y'all. <sighs> Uh, pray for us send us an email and pray for uh, all we'll, of us uh, we'll arrange for you to send kate a care package so no 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 please don't no 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 please talk <laughs> to the people in your life and maybe your kids teachers and just like quick you good fam and we're gonna say ha, 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 uh-huh and then we're gonna cry no i just mean it's this is especially telling you know as the first nine weeks is over and so it's interesting it is interesting mm-hmm. so anyways cool All right. Ready to move on? Fill in the blank. I am. Would you like to do last episode's question? I would love to. So last episode's question. What was the last episode about where I did this? Uh, Pop sigh. I'm not really sure why you did this. So last episode's question. Yes. So before there was Tiger King, there was a news story that made national news on October 18th, 2011, because an Ohio man had turned loose his more than 40 exotic animals, including tigers, lions, and bears. Oh my. Uh, This man was referenced in the now famous documentary Tiger King and Jungle Jack Hanna showed up on the scene of this event to help locate those missing animals. What was the name of that man who let loose all of his exotic animals? It was Terry Thompson. Sure was. Terry Thompson. Okay. I've been seeing a bunch of news articles relating to that since the anniversary. Yeah, it's the anniversary of it. So uh, you maybe you have even see them seen them yep. come by because it was it's still national news even as it yep. is remembered. But well, it had a lot of effect on exotic animal legislation. It did, and especially when Tiger King came out, it got a whole new life. <laughs> it so, sure did. Anyways, this this week's question. You wrote the question. Uh, yeah, this, this question. is going to be released on Veterans Day, so it's a question about Veterans Day. Actually, it's a good idea. There are three U.S. states whose veteran population exceeds one million. That's California, one point five six million, Texas with one point four six million, and Florida with one point four four million. And the states with the highest percentage of veterans are Alaska, Virginia, Montana, Wyoming, Hawaii, and Maine. The Maine one kind of surprised me. Yeah, I don't I was, know why. Everything made sense until Maine. Yeah, yeah. all of them. Yeah, check, 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 mm-hmm. check. Yep, Maine question mark. Yep, all with around ten uh, percent of the adult population being veterans in those those states. These numbers still make up just a fraction of the country's veterans. Approximately how many veterans are currently living in the U.S.? It's a lot. It is. Yeah, it's more than I thought. I don't know why. I don't have a very good scope of the size of the military, though. I think that's it's part large. of my problem. It is. It's very large. Um, so thank you, veterans. Yep. All right. What'd you learn this week? So I listened to one of my new favorite podcasts called Noble Blood, which is typically about um, nobility from all over the world and sort of their really fascinating lives and the things they get themselves into. Mm-hmm. And then the one that I listened to yesterday as I was mowing was about George Washington. And I was like, why ever would this podcast cover him? Mm-hmm. And it was about the, the inaccuracies of the history that suggests that it was ever considered for him to be our King mm-hmm. after mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. the war. And so it's a great episode. It covers the letter that this one guy wrote where he sort of suggested it. It covered George Washington's quick shutdown of like, ain't no way but at the end of it (laughs) you find out that george washington our president former president george washington ours like he's still alive Mm -hmm. our george washington and queen elizabeth ii the current queen are second cousins who are seven times removed wow how cool is that that's why i listened to that i was on the mower and i was like wait and i stopped the mower and i like went back and Rewind. I played it again and I sat there and like my eyes like kind of got squinty because I was like, am I hearing this? And then I was like, wait. And then I listened to her, this host explain it, the entire tree to that point. The family tree. Yeah, again. And then she said it and I was like, okay. And then I immediately came in here and played it for you because yes, <laughs> I was like, did. please advise. So anyways, what I learned is that President George Washington and Queen Elizabeth II, the current queen, are second cousins, seven times removed. Mm-hmm. how wild is that that's pretty wild it's pretty cool yeah yeah so that's what i learned interesting that i'm totally gonna never use that again no but i love knowing trivia out whenever you have a chance you're gonna be like hey did you know yeah no it's it's in there for good now yeah mm-hmm. cool. i'm gonna tell a lot of people that okay all right so what do you learn oh well i started um i've been dabbling with learning unity which is a game development engine basically Uh a lot of modern games are built on top of unity and i've been trying to learn a little bit about game design and do some game design stuff that's why i was listening to that master class about it too but um just kind of generally interested in it i sort of do some work in this 
field adjacent to my my day job, but just trying to learn the ins and outs of this program. And what I got to this week was finally working up to the point of like understanding the the interface, you know, and enough about what's how how the program works and stuff to be able to program a little. Uh, I made him an astronaut. He's a little 2D character. I programmed him to move around the screen, just like a movement script for a player. He looks very cute in when a he game. Moves. So uh, he, well, he's not animated at all. So he's just like completely static and just like floats around when you hit the arrow keys. But I think the next step is going to be making the the sprites for the animation. Um, like his arms. Yeah, like arms and legs moving. So it looks like he's walking and then doing that for each of the directions that he can walk. Right. That'd be cool. So that's the uh, that's the next step, but I felt I felt proud of myself that I got it, even the, the nice very basic level of it functioning. So Great that's work. what I did. Yeah. All right. Any wrap up thoughts? Anything we should know? Uh, no. Just like again, know, we're not going to be here next week, but check next on episode, your teacher I mean. friends. Yeah. Thank you, veterans. Enjoy your breaks. Spend Thanksgiving sleeping, eating a lot, probably grading. If it's anything like what well, mine will be like, <laughs> uh, maybe like binge watch a new show yeah take care of yourself yeah just like do something for you don't get yeah you know, don't let yourself become me at this moment is my story good advice we will see you in four weeks yep signing off see ya bye Thanks for supporting 16 to 1. We're trying to grow our audience, so please check us out at 16to1.com, all spelled out, and tell your friends about the show. On our website, you can find links to follow us on social media, an archive of all our old episodes, and a contact form where you can get in touch. Thanks again for listening, and we'll catch you next show. Let her eat cake.